Uh, please join me in prayer. Lord, we often wonder what you want, expect, and need from us. Help each of us discern your will for our individual lives. Show us how we can each fulfill the destiny that you have in mind for us and how we can personally serve and build your kingdom. And I would ask that you bless this message from you both in its speaking and in its hearing that it might reflect your will and word where we find salvation and truth. Amen. Well, I have been in ministry almost 50 years. And during that entire time, there has been one question that I have been asked over and over again by many different people. And uh, this question comes from young and old men and women, people of all races and, and ethnic groups and different circumstances of life. The question comes in, in many different forms, but it always centers on the will of God. Not the will of God in a generic sense, but rather in a very specific and personal sense. It can take many expressions. Why was I born? Why am I here? What is my purpose in life? What does God want from me, expect from me, need from me? But it all boils down to what is God's will for me? Many people wrestle with this existential question, sometimes for many, many years. They want clarity and sometimes certainty about God's will for their lives. How can I know what God wants for me and from me and with me? How can I discern that and be confident that it really comes from God? And not just from my own individual desires or worse yet, from the enemies of God. How can I discern the truth of God's will and be confident that it's right for me? This is the most common question that I have encountered over the course of my ministry. That, so that is our focus for today. How to discern God's will for you individually, especially when he is leading into something new. I have personally dealt with this many times in my own life, but far and away the biggest change that God has had for, and had for me and led me through was when he called me into the ministry. This marked the most radical change in my life, far bigger and with more far-reaching consequences than any other transition in my life. So I, I want to share it with you as an illustration of what shape God's leading can take, how to discern God's intention and will, and how to confirm that it's coming from God. However, I, I'm sometimes hesitant to do that because I do not want people to think that God's way of leading me is the way or the only way or a special way. It was just the way it happened between me and God. So my story is only an illustration of how God leads and what kind of shape that can take, how it sometimes happens. It's not a, it's not a standard, and I'm not suggesting that it should happen that way for you, but here is how it happened for me. I was raised in a very politically connected family. I grew up knowing congressmen and senators and governors, and they knew me by my first name. They came to my house. My parents participated in strategy and policy sessions with them. My father chaired a national presidential campaign. When I was in junior high school, once my mother, the National Committee chairwoman, a woman named Rhoda Lund, myself and Mamie Eisenhower had lunch around our kitchen table. I worked on political campaigns and traveled with candidates as an advanced man. I worked at the state political headquarters. So I grew up planning to go into politics and get involved in government. In fact, by the time that I had graduated from high school, I had both my educational career and my political career, well, pretty well planned out. 
I was going to study public administration as a way to prepare myself for administrative, not legislative, offices. The summer I graduated from high school, however, I did not have a summer job. But a fellow graduate friend of mine had gotten a job working for a YMCA camp for boys and invited me to apply so we could spend the summer together. Well, I did apply. I got the job as a camp counselor at the camp located about 40 miles north of the Twin Cities on a lake. I was a strong swimmer in those days, so I did lifeguarding, I taught boating and canoeing, and I had been into bicycles all my life, so later in the summer, I began taking 12, 12-year-old boys on week-long bicycle camping trips in northern Minnesota. Just me and 12 boys. Well, as you might imagine, that alone could drive someone into the ministry. But there's, there's more to this story. My parents were not only political, they were outstanding parents. I was raised in a very positive and affirming home. My parents spent enormous amounts of time with me. But the environment of the camp where I was working was anything but affirming. Despite the fact that it was a Christian camp, there was a lot of backbiting and down putting put-downs and, and negativism in the atmosphere in the staff. I had not been used to that kind of environment at home. While I had traveled extensively while in high school, my father was an executive with Northwest Airlines, so I had unlimited pass privileges, and I would frequently fly to Hawaii for the weekend to go surfing. However, camp was the first time that I had lived for any period of time away from my parents. The normal schedule was to work two weeks on, have a day and a half off, and then work another two weeks. So in retrospect, I'm sure a factor of homesickness came into play that summer too. Now, I'm a person who needs a lot of rest. If I don't get my eight hours, I don't do very well. But the director of the camp insisted upon having staff meetings every day. Well, the boys got up about 6 o'clock in the morning and usually didn't settle down until 10 o'clock at night. So the director called staff meetings for midnight every day. After about a month or so, this sleep deprivation started to take a toll on me as well. Now, all of these stressors built up over the summer, but there was one clincher event. When I was in high school, I had gone steady with a girl through my junior and senior high years. But now I was only able to see her one day every two weeks. On the other weekends, we would talk on the telephone. About midway through the summer, I was talking to her on the phone. I, I don't really remember the subject, but in the midst of making a point, she said, Chuck, now my first name isn't Chuck and my middle name isn't Chuck, and nobody ever called me Chuck. But I had a pretty good idea where that came from. I just quietly hung up the phone. You know, the really galling thing about all of this is that when I finally met Chuck, even I had to admit he was a nicer guy than I was. He was just a really cool guy. But that little experience, combined with all the other stressors that were going on, set me into a tailspin. That in my later clinical studies, I came to understand was a reactive depression. I felt utterly betrayed by my girlfriend, and very much alone, powerless, and out of control. I spiraled down into a depression, and as it got deeper, I began to have an effect. It began to have an effect on me physically. You know, you may know that depression tends to lower your immune system. At first, I caught a cold, and then the flu, and eventually, I developed walking pneumonia. Now, my way of dealing with reality is to try to understand it. Now, feeling betrayed as I did, I started to wonder if there was any relationship 
that I could count on, that I could I couldn't count on my girlfriend, I knew that. I, I did not feel close to the people I was working with. I didn't feel I could count on them. And I began wondering if there was any relationship that was dependable. In fact, finding such a relationship soon became an obsession. And if you know anything about depression, you know that it has a, a power, it has a reality of its own. Once it gets a hold on you, it's like a runaway train. You, you can't stop it. You can't shut your brain down. You can't concentrate. You can't sleep. It's hard to function at all. And you just spiral down deeper and deeper. Well, I racked my brain searching for some relationship that I could utterly depend upon. Well, I thought about friends, but they could move away, as many of my high school friends were already doing that summer. Or we could somehow get alienated from each other. I, I thought about my parents. I, I had always had a good relationship with my parents. I loved and respected them, even admired them. They had always been supportive of me. Surely I could depend upon them. But then it occurred to me that they could eventually and would eventually die. And I would be back, left all alone again. Well, the thought came to me, maybe someday I would meet another girl who would be loyal and dependable, someone I could love and who would love me. But then it struck me that she could die too if some terrible thing happened. No matter how much she loved me, no matter how committed she was, she could not prevent herself from dying and intentionally or unintentionally betray me again. There wasn't anyone who was utterly dependable. I lapsed into utter despair and, and, com and complete depression. I, I was emotionally drained and psychologically miserable. I was physically sick. Now, it was during this time that I was also away from camp on the biking trips with the boys. I could not talk to them about my problems, so I felt even more isolated and utterly alone. I can still remember riding down the road on my bicycle and being so sick that I had to lean over and throw up. But I had to keep going down the road. I couldn't stop. One evening, we stopped and made camp I cooked supper for the boys. I led them in devotions. Eventually, they got into their tents, and finally, we all fell asleep. But I woke in the middle of the night, mind racing, sick, miserable beyond imagination. I, I got out of my tent, and I walked about 100 yards into a nearby woods. I sat down at the base of a tree, mulling it over again in my mind, searching for an answer to my dilemma, someone whose loyalty I could utterly trust, someone who would not betray or abandon me, someone I could count on no matter what. I, I wrestled with this question in my mind, turning it over and over and over again until just before dawn, the first light of day was beginning to emerge because I remember being able to see the first colors and the blues and the blacks of night began to give way to the full spectrum of day, and especially the deep green of the woodland. As I sat at the base of that tree, God spoke to me. He spoke in what was not a loud voice, but a very clear and firm voice. Now some have asked me how I could know, how I could be sure it was God speaking, believe me. When God speaks to you, his voice is totally self-authenticating. Some have asked if they had been there, would they have been able to hear his voice? You know, and I don't know the answer to that question, but his voice was clearly and unambiguously audible to me. And what he said was, the answer to your question is my son, Jesus Christ. Well, as was my nature, I began to analyze that answer. 
I had been raised as a Lutheran in the, in the Lutheran church, and I'd been through confirmation, and so I knew about Jesus. I, I began asking the same set of questions I had asked of all the other relationships. What if he moved? Well, he could not move away from me, even if I relocated. Could he be alienated from me? Well, I, I knew nothing could separate us from the love of God in Christ. There was nothing that I could do or he would do that would sever that bond. Question after question was answered until I got to my last question. What if he dies? But he had already died. And in that instant, the realization hit me like a bullet to the brain. Jesus Christ was the answer. The one utterly and completely dependable relationship in the entire universe. And instantly my depression was gone. Within a minute or two, all my physical symptoms were healed. I was filled with enormous um, a sense of joy and elation. It was so overwhelming that even now I'm filled with emotion. Now, 50 years later, in fact, this happened the end of July, 57 years ago this summer. I woke the boys, fixed them breakfast. I had so much energy, I had to get moving. I rode down the highway. The boys could hardly keep up with me. But at the same time, I was frustrated because I really could not express any of this to them. There was no way that they could possibly understand. And we still had almost half a week on the road. But the next two days just buzzed by. I felt like shouting, singing, I don't know what. But I restrained myself for fear the boys would think that I'd lost my mind. Two days later, God came back and spoke to me again. And this time, he said, there are other people out there wrestling with the same question that plagued you. I want you to go and tell them the answer. Well, I took that as a call into the ministry. When I finally got back to camp, I called my parents. I, I told them I thought God had called me into the ministry, and I was going to make some changes in my life to test if what I heard was, in fact, a call, and I had heard it correctly. My parents were a bit surprised, but they were some supportive. Their only agenda was, was my happiness and fulfillment. When I got back home, I talked to my home parish pastor, told him what had happened, and he helped me revise my college curriculum and take courses that would prepare me later for seminary. Many years later, his widow told me that when I was in confirmation class, he had once said to her one time, if God, you know, could ever get a hold of that Hess kid, I think he could do something with him. But I guess at that time, he rather despaired that would ever happen. Well, almost everyone I knew, except my parents, thought I had lost my mind because this was such a radical change from where I had been heading. But you know, I really did not care. I did not then, and I have not since, needed anyone to affirm me. Now, now, don't get me wrong, I, I enjoy, I value the approval of others, but I no longer needed that approval because I had an unshakable, utterly and completely reliable companion in life. Jesus is not a concept, not an abstraction, not a theological truth for me. He is a person, my God and my Savior who reached out to me in my despair, took my hand and lifted me out of the pit and has walked me through life ever since. Now, my faith and my life are far from perfect, but I know that I am loved by one who will never give up on me, never abandon, never leave me, one whom I could never alienate and who would never turn away from me. That is real. I know. I have, I, I have felt that. I have experienced it firsthand. So I began to get more involved in the church. I did a 180-degree turn in my lifestyle. 
This was perhaps one reason why so many people could not understand what was happening to me. The, the change they saw was so completely different that they just did not know what to make of it. But I was looking for confirmation of my call from God, not from others. By the time I got through my second year of Greek in college, I had no doubts God was blessing me and wanted me to go into the ministry. In many ways, the rest of my life has been a footnote to this experience. I have tried to equip myself and hone my spiritual gifts so that I could serve better. And, and I've tried to develop my courage so that I would have the guts to walk through the doors that God opened for me and the strength to accept the doors that he closed. He has come back often to guide, to redirect, to coach me through my life and my ministry, including telling me he wanted me to share this particular story. Now, as I said earlier, this is my story. It need not and probably should not be anyone else's story. God works in many different ways in different people's lives. This was just the way he worked in my life. But this amounted to a huge and life-altering change for me. He had led me into something completely new and different. Maybe he has something like that in store for you. Or maybe the new thing he is calling you to is, is more simple, less complicated. But if God is calling you to something new, how do you know that? How do you discern it? And, and how do you confirm that it is from God? There are certain tests that you can apply that can confirm whatever calling you are receiving is from God and can assure that it is coming from God. Any one of these tests is probably not sufficient alone to confirm God's will for you. But together they can help you know clearly God's will for your life. The first question to ask is, does what you are being pointed to <clears throat> align with the values of the Bible? God is often unpredictable, but he is never inconsistent or fickle. God is not going to reveal one thing in Scripture and something different to you personally. This is a common but terrible error that many people make. They think that their own their own personal insights or revelations supersede the Bible, and that is never true. If the calling or the teaching toward which you are being pointed is not in line with the teachings of the Bible, you can be sure that it is not coming from God. The second thing you're going to want to do is to start moving in the direction that you're being called or pointed. Pray about this, but do not just sit there and wait for some definitive or final answer or direction. Start heading and working in the direction you think God is pointing you. You'll remember that I said I, I started to adjust my life towards the direction I thought God was calling me. For me, that meant getting more involved in church activities and service, and it meant changing my well, my language toward the less profane. Although I suppose I have to admit it, certain circumstances, the, the old language does come back to me. It, it also meant realigning my educational goals. I switched from a major in public administration to a major in history with a double minor in philosophy and humanities. Just like it's easier to steer a car when it's moving, than when it's sitting still, so too it's easier for God to direct or redirect us when our lives are moving forward. So if you feel that you are getting a call or guidance from God, don't just sit there and wait for more clarity. Start moving in that direction, and God will fine-tune your life further with urgings and direction so that it lines up with his will for you. Early on, seek out the advice and counsel of wise and spiritually mature people who know and care about you. 
Again, you remember I talked to my parents, and then I went to see my pastor. I, I sought out their reaction and their assessment as to whether this calling was from God and appropriate for me. It's an important step to get the judgment of those who can be impartial and neutral, but at the same time have your best interests at heart. If several key people in your life affirm the direction that you are heading, it's a sign that you're not headed off on some wild tangent somewhere. Assess your spiritual gifts. If you have never taken a spiritual gift inventory, do so as quickly as possible. Spiritual gifts are supernatural powers that and abilities granted to believers by the Holy Spirit. They are intended for the upbuilding of the body of Christ, the church, and the advancement of the kingdom. The spiritual gifts you have been granted are one of the best signs of what God's will is for you because God equips his people to carry out the ministries to which he calls them. So it's vitally important to assess your spiritual gifts. They will be the basis of God's intention for you. There are at least 21 spiritual gifts mentioned in the Bible. Find a good assessment or a class and identify your spiritual gifts. Finally, look for signs and indicators of what God wants from you, and for you. You remember that I said I understood my successfully taking two years of Greek in college as a sign that God wanted me to go into the ministry. Well, frankly, I realized that my doing well in Greek was an act of God, a sign and a confirmation of his call. Now, you may feel that God has given you no signs, that, in fact, if, you, if he had done so, you would not be struggling to discover his will for your life. But I can assure you that God's signs and directions have been all around you. You just have not been paying attention. If you've ever noticed, when you buy a certain make and model of car, you begin seeing that make and model on the road. That's not because there's been a sudden upswing in the sales of that make and model. Nothing has changed as far as the number of those vehicles on the road. What has changed is your consciousness and your awareness. You are suddenly paying attention to cars that you previously ignored. So begin looking for signs and indications from God, and you will begin seeing them. Let me give you an example from my own experience. Back in 1978, a pastor on the then district staff of the Lutheran Church, Warren Salveson, was living here in Clear Lake. He was the one who founded and developed the Lutheran Resource Center here. He was a member of Zion, and he felt called to start a new congregation in Clear Lake, which eventually became Galilean. I was friends with Warren, and I was the first pastor he approached about starting a new congregation here. At that time, I was living in Norway, Iowa, and I was serving a parish there. At his invitation, Muriel and I drove up here to Clear Lake to hear his ideas about starting a new congregation. He showed me around the town and tried very hard to sell me on the idea of starting a new congregation. He even showed me a a potential facility where it could be located. Today, that is the site of Agape Church. After spending a few days here and listening to Warren's urging, Muriel and I drove back to our home in Norway. During that drive, I said to Muriel, I don't really see myself as a mission developer, Frankly, I more see myself as the pastor of Zion. Now, that was in 1978. I did not get the call to Zion until 1989, over 10 years later. But when I did get that call, it was clear to me that God was preparing me to serve Zion long years before. It was a sign that God wanted me to serve Zion. If you look for them, you will find that God does provide guideposts and signs to lead you along the way that he wants you to go. 
Let me say that if God seems to be pointing you towards some new way of serving in his kingdom, but you're unsure if it is the right direction for you to follow, apply these principles. Individually, they are not definitive indicators, but in combination they can give you clarity and confidence about God's will for you. And if God is indeed wanting to take you to a new place, a new way of serving, do not be afraid and do not lack confidence. Because if it is God's leading, he will provide all that you need. He will set you on a new, thrilling, and exciting adventure beyond your imagination. Trust him. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we, we seek your will for our lives. But for many of us, the way is not always clear. By your Holy Spirit, help us to discern your calling so that we know it is from you and it is right for us. Grant us signs and, and give us guidance as we seek to be your faithful people. Show us the important role that you have for each of us in your kingdom. Amen.